Professor Craig now has eight minutes for a rebuttal. Timekeeper, are you ready? Begin. The less moral framework is atheism. Atheism has no grounds for objective moral values or duties. And it's interesting that in that last speech, I was disappointed to hear no defense given of that crucial uh, second contention that I offered against Dr. Harris's view. Remember, we talked about the value problem. I gave what I consider a knockdown argument to show that the moral landscape is not identical to the continuum of human flourishing. We talked about objective moral duties, the is versus ought distinction, the ought implies can problem. None of these have been responded to. So if you want a really desperate moral system, try atheism. There's no foundation for objective moral values and duties there. Now, what about theism? Does it do any better? Well, in the last speech, we heard some attacks on my first contention that God provides a sound foundation for morality. Unfortunately, it seems to be that most of these were red herrings. A red herring is a, a, a smelly old fish that's dragged across the path of the bloodhounds to distract them from their true query so they get distracted and go off following the, the dead fish. And I'm not going to be distracted by the red herrings that were offered in that last speech. For example, in response to my claim that if God exists, then objective moral values exist, uh, we heard that I haven't truly offered an alternative to his view because the goal on theism is to avoid hell. Honestly, that it just simply shows how poorly Sam Harris understands Christianity. You don't believe in God to avoid going to hell. Belief in God isn't some kind of fire insurance. You believe in God because God as the supreme good is the appropriate object of adoration and love. He is goodness itself to be desired for its own sake. And so the fulfillment of human existence is to be found in relation to God. It is because of who God is and his moral worth that he is worthy of worship. It has nothing to do with avoiding hell, uh, hell or promoting your own well-being. He then responds, but there's no good reason to believe that such a being exists. Look at the problem of evil and the problem of the unevangelized. Both of these, as I explained in my opening speech, are irrelevant in tonight's debate because I'm not arguing that God exists. Maybe he's right. Maybe these are insuperable objections to uh, Christianity or to theism. It wouldn't affect either of my contentions that if God exists, then we have a sound foundation for moral values and duties. If God does not exist, then we have no foundation for objective moral values and duties. So these are red herrings. Now, I have written on each of these problems, the problem of evil and the problem of the unevangelized, and you can find much of what I've said at our website, reasonablefaith.org. If you're interested, go ahead and look at that. Or, as Michael Ray suggested, talk to one of your philosophy professors. Michael has written extensively on the problem of evil, uh, and I'm sure he'd love to have a conversation with you about uh, those things. Notice, uh, secondly, I would want to say, evil actually proves that God exists. Because if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. If evil exists, then it follows that objective values and duties do exist. Namely, some things are evil. So evil actually proves the existence of God, since in the absence of God, good and evil as such would not exist. So you cannot press both the problem of evil and agree with my uh, contention that uh, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist because evil actually will be an argument for the existence of God. Notice that Dr. Harris has no moral foundation for saying that Christian beliefs are morally execrable because he has no foundation for making such a judgment. If atheism is true, what objective foundation is there for affirming that one view is execrable and another is not? There's simply no basis for such judgments. So, if he wants to have a debate on theism, I will happily uh, engage in one with him, but that's not the debate for tonight. He also says there's, uh, it's psychopathic to believe these things. Now, that remark is just as stupid as it is insulting. 
Uh, it is absurd to think that people like Professor Peter Van Inwagen here at the University of Notre Dame is psychopathic, or that a guy like Dr. Tom Flint, who is as gracious a Christian gentleman as I could have ever met, is psychopathic. Uh, this is simply uh, below the belt. So it seems to me that we've not been given any refutation of the view that if God does exist, then his essence, his character, is determinative for the existence of objective moral values. What about objective moral duties? Here I explained that God's commands must be consistent with his nature. And Dr. Harris continues to press the point, oh, but the Bible supports slavery. Again, I'll refer you to Professor Copan's book, which shows that that is a gross misrepresentation of ancient Israel, which did not, in fact, promote slavery, as we understand it uh, in light of the experience in the American South. Um, but again, that's simply not irrelevant, because I'm not, uh, that isn't relevant, because I'm not defending uh, the Bible tonight. I'm saying that uh, for a theist, whether Jew, Christian, deist, Hindu, uh, moral duties will be grounded in the divine commands which are based in his nature. He says, but then what about people like the Taliban who say that God has commanded them to do certain atrocities? I would say the very same thing to the Taliban that Dr. Harris says, namely, God did not command you to do those things. That's exactly what Dr. Harris would say. The reason he thinks that is because he doesn't believe that God exists, but I would say that because I think that the Taliban has got the wrong God, that in fact God hasn't commanded them to commit these atrocities, and indeed God uh, will only issue such commands are, as are consistent with his moral nature and for which he has morally sufficient reasons. So I don't think this first contention is really in much dispute tonight. I, I think it's obvious that if God exists, then obviously objective moral values exist independently of human opinion. They're grounded in the character of God. And there would be objective moral duties if God exists because our duties arise in response to the moral imperatives that God issues to us. So the real debate is on that second contention. Can atheism provide a good foundation for objective moral values and duties? And I think we've seen powerful reasons to think that it cannot. Dr. Harris now has eight minutes. Timekeeper, are you ready? Begin. Well, you, perhaps you've noticed Dr. Craig has a charming habit of summarizing his opponent's points in a way in which they were not actually given, so I will leave it to you to sort it out on YouTube. Um, needless to say, I didn't call those esteemed colleagues of his psychopaths, as I made clear. Um, in any case, Dr. Clay, Craig has merely defined God as being intrinsically good. It's, if you want to charge someone with merely semantic games, it, it, the, the shoe's on, on the other foot as well. There, there, is, there is no reason that I can see why there couldn't be an evil God, uh, or several. Okay, he, but his God is intrinsically good. Goodness is grounded in his very nature. That is a, 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 definitional, a definitional move that he's made. Now, I have presented a positive case for grounding an objective morality in the context of science. And thinking about moral truth in the context of science should only pose a problem for you if you imagine that a science of morality has to be absolutely self-justifying in a way that no science ever could be. Okay, the, the, every branch of science must rely on certain axiomatic assumptions. Okay, certain core values. And a science of morality would be on the same footing as a science of medicine or physics or chemistry. You need only assume that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad and worth avoiding, and indeed the worst case scenario for conscious life. And if science is unscientific, if, this, if, 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 if having a, a value assumption at the core renders science unscientific, what is scientific? Now, Dr. Craig is confused about what it means to speak with scientific objectivity about the human condition. He says things like, from the point of view of science, we're just 
constellations of atoms and were no more valuable than rats or insects. Okay, as though the only scientifically objective thing that could be said about us is that we're constellations of atoms. Okay, there, there are two very different senses in which we, we use these terms subjective and objective. Okay, there, there's, the, the first is, is epistemological. It, it relates to how we know. And when we say we're reasoning or thinking objectively in this sense, we're talking about, about the style in which we're thinking. We're talking about the fact that we're, we're, we're seeing through our biases, we, we, we're, we should just say, trying to jettison bias. We are reasoning uh, in, in, in a way that's available to the data. Okay, our minds are open to counter arguments. Uh, now, this is, the, this is the absolute foundation of science. And this is, what, th this is what opens such an invidious gulf between science and religion, the difference here in this approach to objectivity. But science does not require that we ignore the fact that certain facts are subjective, ontologically subjective. Okay, there, there are facts about the human condition that science can understand and study that are first-person facts, facts about what it's like to be you. Okay, and, and we can study these facts, and our study of them reveals how much deeper and richer and more meaningful our lives are than the lives of cockroaches. Okay, so this, this is a false reductionism that he's purveying here. Now, so there are subjective facts. If you happen to have an intact nervous system, being burned alive will be excruciatingly painful. The painfulness of pain is a subjective fact about you. Okay, I'm, what my argument uh, entails is that there, there are, we can speak objectively about a certain class of, of subjective facts uh, that go by the name of morality, that relate to questions of good and evil, and these depend upon on the well-being of conscious creatures, especially our own. And by this light, we can see that it's possible to value the wrong things. I mean, if you think you prefer to be neurotic and in pain and incapable of creative work and completely disconnected from other people, there's something wrong with you. Okay. Objectively wrong with you? Yes. Okay. In, in that you are, you are closed to higher states of consciousness. Higher with respect to what? Higher as in further from the lowest possible state of consciousness, the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay. Is the worst possible misery for everyone really bad? Once again, I, we have hit philosophical bedrock with the shovel of a stupid question. Right. Now, I want to take a, a brief moment to speak about these higher possibilities, because it's often thought that non-believers like myself are closed to some remarkable experiences that religious people have. That's not true. That's not true. There's nothing that prevents an atheist from experiencing self-transcending love and ecstasy and rapture and awe. There's nothing that prevents an atheist from going into a cave for a year like a proper mystic and, and, and doing nothing but meditate on compassion, say. What atheists don't tend to do is make unjustifiable and unjustified claims about the nature of the cosmos or about the divine origin of certain books on the basis of those experiences. Now, the prospect of somebody becoming a true saint in life and, and inspiring people long after their deaths is something that I take very seriously. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying meditation with some very great, wise old yogis and, and Tibetan lamas who have spent decades on retreat. I mean, really remarkable people. Okay? People who I actually consider to be spiritual geniuses of a certain sort. And so I can well imagine if... if Jesus was a spiritual genius, you know, a palpably non-neurotic and charismatic and wise person. I can well imagine the experience of his disciples. I can well imagine the kind of influence he could have on their lives. Okay. No, we do not have to presuppose anything on insufficient evidence in order to explore this higher terrain of human well-being. We don't have to take anything on faith. We don't have to lie to ourselves or to, to our children about the nature of reality. If we want to understand our situation in the world, along with these deeper possibilities, we have to do it in the spirit of science. 
Okay, given, given that people have had these remarkable experiences in every context, while worshiping one God, while worshiping hundreds, while worshiping none, that proves that, that a deeper principle is at work. That, that the sectarian claims of, of our various religions can't possibly be true in that context. And all we have is human conversation to capture these possibilities. We can either have a first century conversation as dictated by the New Testament, or a 7th century conversation, as dictated by the Quran, or a 21st century conversation that leaves us open to the, the full wealth of human learning. Please think about these things. We're now moving to five-minute closing speeches. Timekeeper, are you ready? Okay, begin. In my closing statement, I'd like to try to draw together some of the threads of the debate and see if we can come to some conclusions. First, I argued that God, if he exists, provides the sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. By the time of his last rebuttal, the only argument that I heard Dr. Harris offering against this position is to say that you're merely defining God as good, which is the same fallacy I accused him of uh, committing. I don't think this is the case at all. God is a being worthy of worship. Any being that is not worthy of worship is not God. And therefore, God must be perfectly good and essentially good. More than that, as Anselm saw, God is the greatest conceivable being, and therefore he is uh, the very paradigm of goodness itself. He is the greatest good. So once you understand the concept of God, you can see that asking, well, why is God good, is sort of like asking, why are all bachelors unmarried? Uh, it's the very concept of the greatest conceivable being, a being worthy of worship that entails the essential goodness of God. And I think it's evident that if God exists, then we do have objective moral values and duties. Secondly, I argued, if God does not exist, we have no foundation for objective moral values or objective moral duties. Um, I showed that on his view, there is, it is logically impossible to say that the moral landscape is identical to the landscape of the flourishing of conscious beings, and that therefore his view is incoherent. We also looked at the is-ought distinction and the ought implies can, to which Dr. Harris has never replied in the course of this evening's debate. In his last speech, he said, but we simply must rely upon certain axioms. Well, that's the same as saying you've got to take it by faith. Uh, and if these axioms are moral axioms, then I think he's admitting my point, that on atheism, there simply is no ground for believing the objectivity of moral values and duties. He just takes them by a leap of faith. He says, well, there are different senses of the word objective. Yes, of course, and in my opening speech, I made clear the sense in which I was defining the term. I mean valid and binding, independent of human opinion. And moral values are not objectively binding and valid in that way on atheism. He says science can study subjective facts. For example, pain is a subjective fact. Granted, that's certainly true. So my question is, is the wrongness of an action a subjective fact? On atheism, it's hard to see how it couldn't be any more, anything more than a subjective fact, in which case you cannot say, as Dr. Harris wants to say, and I agree with him, that the genital mutilation of little girls is objectively wrong, not just a subjective uh, opinion. He says, well, but uh, if you're psychopathic or neurotic, there's something wrong with you. Granted, I agree with that. There is something wrong with you. But the question is, on atheism, if atheism were true, would there be anything objectively morally wrong with doing what the psychopath does? He hasn't been able to show that. Indeed, there are no moral duties on his view. And remember, he himself admitted that psychopaths could occupy the peaks of well-being on his so-called moral landscape and that therefore it is not a moral landscape at all. To conclude, I want to quote from a remarkable article that appeared in the Duke Law Journal by uh, Arthur Allen Leff called Unspeakable Ethics, Unnatural Law. Dr. Leff's 
difficulty is the same as Dr. Harris's. He wants to find a foundation for moral values and duties, in this case for the law, that would be uh, independent of human opinion, would be objective and would be in the world, and he can't find one. Uh, he says, any attempt to ground values in the world is open to the playground bullies retort, who says? And this is how his article concludes. All I can say is this, it looks as if we are all we have. Only if ethics were something unspeakable by us, that is something transcendent, could law be unnatural and therefore unchallengeable. As things now stand, everything is up for grabs. Nevertheless, napalming babies is bad. Starving the poor is wicked. Buying and selling each other is depraved. There is in the world such a thing as evil. All together now, says who? God help us. And now Dr. Harris has five minutes. Timekeeper, are you ready? Begin. I'm curious, how many of you consider yourselves to be devout Muslims? I see a show of hands. Don't mean to single anyone out, but not many. Now, you're all aware, of course, that the Quran exists and claims to be the perfect word of the creator of the universe. You're aware that once having heard of this possibility and rejecting it, you're all going to hell for eternity. I mean, needless to say, Dr. Craig and I are both going to hell if this vision of life is true. The problem is that everything Dr. Craig has said tonight, with a few modifications, could be said in defense of Islam, in fact, has been said in defense of Islam. Okay, the logic is exactly the same. We have a book that claims to be the word of the creator of the universe. It tells us about the nature of moral reality and how to live within it. But what if, what if Muslims are right? And what if Islam is true? Okay, how should we view God in moral terms? How would we view God in moral terms? Or I should say Allah. Okay, we, we have been born in the wrong place to the wrong parents, given the wrong culture, given the wrong theology. Okay, needless to say, Dr. Craig is doomed. He's been thoroughly confused by Christianity. I mean, just appreciate what a bad position he's now in to appreciate the true word of God. I've been thoroughly misled by science. Okay, where is Allah's compassion? Okay. And yet, in it, it, he's, omni he's omnipotent. He could change this in an instant. He could give us a sign that would convince everyone in this room. And yet, he's not going to do it. And hell awaits. And hell awaits our children because we can't help but mislead our children. Okay, now just hold this vision in mind. And, and first appreciate how little sleep you have lost over this possibility. Okay, just feel in yourself at this moment how carefree you are and will continue to be in the face of this possibility. What are the chances that we're all going to go to hell for, for eternity because we haven't recognized the Quran to be the perfect word of the creator of the universe. Please know that this is exactly how Christianity appears to someone who's not been indoctrinated by it. Our scriptures were written by people who by, 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 by virtue of their placement in history had less access to scientific information and facts and basic common sense than any person in this room. Okay. In fact, there's not a person in this room who's ever met a person whose worldview was as narrow as the worldview of Abraham or Moses or Jesus or Muhammad. And mo most of these people, with a few exceptions, had, had a moral worldview that was more or less indistinguishable from that of an Afghan warlord today. And yet Dr. Craig insists that the authors of the Bible knew everything they had to know about the nature of the cosmos and about how to live within it to guide us at this moment. 
Okay, I want to suggest to you that this vision of life can't possibly be true. Okay, but just as there's no such thing as Christian physics or Muslim algebra, there can be no such thing as Christian or Muslim morality. Whatever is true about our circumstance in moral terms and in spiritual terms is discoverable now and can be talked about in, in language that is not an outright affront to everything that we've learned in the last 2,000 years. Okay, what remains for us to discover are the facts in every domain of knowledge that will allow the greatest number of us to live lives truly worth living in this world. I mean, how is it that we can build a global civilization, a viable global civilization of now destined to be nine billion people where the maximum number of people truly flourish? That is the challenge we face. Sectarian moral denominations, okay, a world shattered, balkanized by competing claims about an invisible God is not the way to do it, apart from the fact that there's no evidence in the first place that should be compelling to us to adopt that view. The only tool we need is honest inquiry. And I would suggest to you that if faith is ever right about anything in this domain, it's right by accident. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to all of you. We started 15 minutes late, and so I'm going to allow us to go until 9.15. That gives us 30 minutes for questions. As I said at the beginning, we're going to allow Notre Dame students to ask the first four questions. After that, the microphones are open to anyone. We'd like to keep a brisk pace for the questions, so please limit your questions to about 30 seconds, and I've, I've asked the debaters to limit their responses to about two minutes. I'll take the liberty of urging people to get quickly to their point if these time limits are violated. Uh, we have microphones here and here. I think we have microphones. Oh, good. I can see the microphones yeah. in the balcony, so I'll just go in a circuit. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Harris, if Dr. Craig could link out of your objections about the problem of evil and the problem of choosing the right religion um, so that those weren't really problems, th those weren't functioning in the debate, where does that put you dialectically? Well, how, how do those function in the debate? Do, do you mean if I was given good reason to believe that Christianity is true? So, um, or if and, Dr. And, and, Craig could show that um, choosing a particular religion wasn't necessary for the grounding of, uh, of um, morality, just that some religion being true was sufficient for there being a grounding for morality, and that the problem of evil was somehow answered. Well, I, I would never be tempted to dispute that we could make up a religion that, if true, would be a grounding of morality. I mean, well, you could, you, those, are, those imaginary schemes are, are there for the asking. We could make them up. Uh, we could, and, and, and in about five minutes, we could make up a better religion than any that exists. I mean, you just, you just take Christianity and cut out Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and already you've done great work. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, we could, write, we could rewrite the Ten Commandments in less than five minutes and improve upon it. Um, so, you know, being kind to, add being kind to children and swap out the bit about the graven images, and you've already made it a, a much wiser document. Now, um, so, but that, that's not the point. I mean, the, the, the point is that one point I made, which, which he, he never really addressed, is that the, the, you're, you're smuggling in a concern for well-being in any case. You just have a different timeline. If Christianity were true, it would be part of my moral landscape. I mean, if, if someone like myself is going to suffer in hell for eternity based on what I'm currently thinking, then I clearly am, am doing the wrong thing. I mean, I would, I would, want, I would want that information, and I would think, uh, I mean, that, that would be a revelation to me, which I would take seriously, and I would do everything I could to get into heaven. I mean, that would be, heaven is the, if, if eternity in heaven versus eternity in hell is really the, 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 the landscape that we're living on, well, that's part of my moral landscape. It just changes its, its, its temporal characteristics. There's just no reason to think that that's the universe we're living in. 
Thank you. Up and to my left. Hi. Uh, Professor Craig, uh, you made an interesting analogy. You said uh, that long before we could uh, explain scientifically where light came from, we could distinguish between uh, light and dark and that the same could be said for good and evil. But to me, that analogy seems dangerous because long before we could explain scientifically where light came from, we said it came from God. Could the same be said for morality? And then also, how do you explain shifts in moral consensus over time? Okay, I'm not sure I understood all of the questions, so I might need our moderator to help me here, the, the last part of the question was shifts in morality over time. Don't confuse moral ontology with moral epistemology. Moral ontology is the foundation in reality for objective moral values and duties. Moral epistemology is how we come to know the goods that there are and the duties that we have. And clearly, affirming that there are objective moral values and duties doesn't mean that we always know them infallibly. Uh, clearly, over time, there's such a thing as moral growth and moral development. When I look at my own life, I, I look back at my life as a young man and I can see certain attitudes and things that I had that I now would be ashamed of morally. I think I've experienced moral growth. So uh, there's, there's no reason to think that the objectivity of moral values and, and duties implies that there isn't such a thing as moral growth or a clearer apprehension of the good or sadly, in some cases, a moral degeneration of a society and turning away from good. So these are two different problems, and, and my concern is moral uh, ontology. Now, I didn't catch the first part of the question. Mike, did you? Uh... Uh, yeah, tell me if I misrepresent you, but I take it that she's asking, you, you say that we understood light and dark oh. before we understood the physics of light. Um, she says, but we posited supernatural explanations for light also oh. at that time. Why not think morality is in the same situation? Yeah, again, the, I think you misunderstood the analogy there that I'm making. What I'm saying there is distinguishing moral ontology from moral semantics. And I, what I'm saying is I'm not offering a moral semantical theory about the meaning of the words good and evil, right and wrong. I'm talking about their foundation in reality. And so the example of light was simply to give an example of where people understood the meaning of the English word light, even if they didn't know its physical nature in terms of electromagnetic radiation. Can I clarify? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I get that you're arguing that there needs to be a source for good and evil. That makes sense. So why does that source have to be God? Could it not be that we just haven't discovered what the source is yet? Well, that would be my second contention, that in the absence of God, I can't see any foundation that would be left for affirming the objectivity of moral values, and particularly the value of human beings and conscious life on this planet. And then that second problem about objective moral duties is especially serious, the is-ought distinction, and then the ought implies can problem, no free will. So that, that would just be to reiterate the arguments I've already given as to why I think in the absence of God, uh, there wouldn't be objective moral values and duties. I allowed the follow-up only because there was misunderstanding, just so you know. <laughs> Up and to my right. Yeah, uh, I've got a question for Dr. Harris. Um, so a lot of the argument, I guess, I, I've, I felt like it depended a lot on the definition of good and, of good and bad, right and wrong. And I wanted to ask you, if you thought it would, it would be possible for there to be, um, so I've got a two-part question, for there to be a hypothetical God that, um, so to scratch everything you know about Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, create your own new God, and if it would be hypothetical for this God to perfectly align with your definition of moral, th of, of moral theory, so say that this God says and, and commands that good and bad are dependent on the well-being of, of conscious animals. And then uh, simultaneously to that question, whether you think a God of love does just that. Because it, it seems to me, in, in my experience in, in looking at history, that there is uh, no greater continuum across human history than the presence of love and the fact that we've had marriage, whether homosexual, heterosexual, transgender, from the moment we've been, we've been living animals. And so if that really is the root of our well-being, 
then how does a, how does a God of love not promote well-being? So, but and, and yeah, the first part yeah, yeah. Well, well, love clearly has a lot to do with with our well-being. Uh, and if there were a God of love uh, who was really acting like a God of love uh, and was making um, I mean, the problem is that the existence of God doesn't really add to the moral stature of love in that case, because, or, or the moral stature of the good. I mean, this is to, goes to the Euthyphro dilemma that we haven't spoken about, probably, mercifully. Uh, but, I mean, if, if, if it's either intrinsically good or it isn't, and for God to say it's good uh, doesn't make it more good, uh, and it's not, it's not good by fiat. So he's either saying it's good because it is good, in which case we can just deal with the fact that it is good, or it's just good because he says it's good, but then he can say any evil thing is good, which Dr. Craig's God does rather often, uh, apparently. So, um, but love is clearly uh, something we, we desperately want in our lives, and we're right to want it. We're deeply social creatures. Uh, and the fear that is sort of circulating here, that's, that, that well-being somehow leaves something out that's important, I think, and I argue at some length in my book, is, is quite unfounded, because whatever you bring to me which, which is truly important, you say, okay, you're talking about well-being, but here I'm talking about self-transcending love. This is really important. Well, self-transcending love is, a, is a, uh, uh, probably at the core of, of, of the deepest well-being that we can experience as human beings. And, but likewise, if the Christian hell exists and awaits me, uh, well-being in the in the end is predicated on avoiding those flames, and so that I means so all of that you're you're, still, you're smuggling smuggling in a concern about consciousness and its future changes, whatever you bring uh, in the moral domain, and and so I'm I'm saying we we must be honest about that. We ground this in consciousness, and then we can talk about how how human beings like ourselves can can thrive. And and I would I would grant you that love is 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 probably on on the the top of the list. Uh, down here to my right. Um, Mr. Harris, um, uh, from my personal experience and uh, from my faith, I find that um, Christ's first uh, commandment was to love thy neighbor and you know thy God. And I believe that uh, if you are a Muslim, then you follow through with that. If you are a devout Muslim and you care about the well-being of all mankind. And um, it's kind of in relation to my next question, which is like, how would a naturalist respond to amazing miracles by God, which like say the miracle of the sun, which was witnessed by 30,000 to 100,000 people in Fatima, Portugal in 1917, as well as miracles of the Eucharist in which the Eucharist actually starts to form veins and bleed and where this blood is actually tested and is found to be AB positive from the left ventricle of the heart um, and it's actually been researched under leading pathologists in New Zealand to actually be throbbing and living as it was in its, his laboratory for the 30 days. Okay, uh, well, uh, <laughs> the, the problem with, with miracle stories are that they're, they, they truly are a dime a dozen. I mean, the miracle stories that cash out Christianity are miracle stories set in the context of the, the pre-scientific context of, of the first century Roman Empire, attested to by copies of copies of copies of ancient Greek manuscripts that have thousands of discrepancies. Now, there are miracle stories that you can find in India today, attested to by living eyewitnesses. So you look at the people surrounding someone like Satya Sai Baba. Thousands of Western-educated people go to India, spend time with Satya Sai Baba, and come away claiming that he's performed a variety of miracles. And in fact, if you, if you add up all those stories, every miracle attributed to Jesus, inclu in, in, including the resurrection of the dead, is attributed to Satya Sai Baba. And, he's, and millions of people think he's a living God. These stories, from our point of view, don't even merit an hour on the Discovery Channel. Okay? And yet, 2.3 billion people think that the miracles of Jesus are worth organizing your life around. And that, that I think, is a, a, uh, an intellectually unsustainable disparity. Now, I'm not, I'm not closed to the evidence of miracles, and it would be trivially easy for God to convince me of, of his existence, or the powers of, uh, of psychic powers of saints, or whatever it is. I mean, if you can tell, I've got a 20-digit 
number written on a piece of paper in my I'm wallet. I'm not God, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. But if, if, you, if you tell me what that number is, then we have a, a very interesting miracle on our hands. Yeah, I still don't. I, I can't let the follow-ups continue. I'm sorry. We, we have a whole bunch of people lined up. Yes, over here. Uh, Dr. Craig, um, I know you wanted to kind of stay away from the uh, epistemological questions, but I, um, I, I need some advice. Um, uh, because um, it, it, accepting an objective good, uh, I guess, where do we go from that practically? Because some, something happened to me last night where, um, I mean, I, I've, been, I, I've been a Christian, but um, last night, God appeared to me, and he he told me that 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 homosexual lovemaking was it was every bit as beautiful and and loving and good um, as as heterosexual uh, uh, procreative sex in in the in the system of marriage. And and he he said, "Come and and let everyone know that." I said, "No, God, they won't believe me." They, they won't, they won't, they will not believe me. I, I, how do I, where, where do we, where do we go from here practically with, with divine revelation? It, do I, do I leave my church you're, and Look, follow, your feigned sincerity about this, you know, no, isn't not, fooling anybody. It's not the topic of tonight's debate. Uh, I'm not even going to address I, a, I, a I, silly I, question like this. I, I didn't mean to offend I, you. I'm serious. Sorry, we, we aren't doing follow-ups with the question. I allowed the one up there because there was a misunderstanding. But the question has come out. It's received an answer. So this question is for doc, Dr. Harris. <laughs> Unfortunately, mine won't be as funny. Uh, okay. So it seems to me that there's, there's a distinction in in your argument that I'd like you to discuss, which is the conceptual possibility of the most miserable world and its material possibility. So basically what I'm asking is whether you can cite any evidence to believe that this is not the world that is most miserable or otherwise. So if you can't, let's assume this is the world with materially, the material conditions for the most misery to exist, then wouldn't it be moral to destroy it all, destroy all consciousness? So I'm just wondering, no. how would you distinguish no. that yes. this is not the worst possible world? Well, it may be the only world with conscious life. I mean, I, I think, I, I doubt that given the, the trillion-fold universe we're living in, but it, it, we don't have any evidence of, of life elsewhere, much less conscious life. Um, but so this, this, your question cuts to the issue of, you know, what if, if it's all about well-being, well, why don't we just, you know, kill all the unhappy people in their sleep tonight? Okay, why would, that, wouldn't that raise sort of the aggregate level of well-being on, on Earth? Uh, and there are an infinite number of, of thought experiments like that you can come up with that seem to push on this concern. Well, if it's just about suffering, well, you can just eradicate it. Uh, uh, painlessly for people, and you have, have increased the net well-being. But all of those thought experiments neglect all of the cascading effects of living in a world in which we do that sort of thing, where the consequences of doing that. So why don't we, why don't we, um, and the classic experiment that, that everyone trots out is, um, what if you're a doctor and you realize that you have uh, somebody who could benefit from the organs of you know, uh, you have five people who could benefit from the organs of one person who's sitting in your waiting room. So you, you go into your waiting room, you, you knock him out, and you euthanize him, you, you vivisect him, and you give away his organs, okay? That seems like it's, it's a net benefit to five people. Okay, but if we were all living in a world where at, at any moment your doctor could vivisect you and steal your organs, um, that would have rather obvious, ghastly consequences that none of us would want to submit to. And there's a our intuitions about the sanctity of human life, caring for, uh, for people, treating people as, as ends in themselves rather than means to some other end, all of that conserves intuitions we have about trust and its importance in life and, and all of these uh, ways in which we are knit together as a community uh, and, and, and ways in which only, uh, we only rise or fall together. I mean, so it's a, it's a, in a very important sense, our happiness is, is dependent upon the happiness of others. I mean, we are not atomized selves that, that are, are um, 
uh, radically separate. So this idea that, that killing everyone, I mean, first of all, killing everyone would, would just, would, would eradicate all the suffering, yes, but it would also foreclose all the happiness. I mean, it would, it would, it would nullify every possibility of experience. Uh, so if you think that the, the, a universe where the lights are on is better than a universe where the lights are off, then uh, turning the lights off is worse. But um, I, I could imagine a universe which it would be worth turning the lights off in. I mean, the Christian hell is one of them. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd be doing people a lot of good. The question is whether you know uh, this Sorry, no follow-ups. <laughs> But, but I'm going to be really strict about this. Thank you for it, it, answering the question. Well, to, to answer your question, if this is the only world, well, then it is by definition both the most miserable and the happiest, uh, and everything in between. And now I just have no idea whether what else is out there. Up on my right. Uh, Dr. Craig, uh, when discussing uh, Islam and more specifically the Taliban, you said that they uh, have the wrong God, citing, I assume, their... Um, or violent attacks uh, based on jihad, and because of that, how do you know that you have the right God? And if you do have the right God, uh, what explanation can you offer for him authorizing the Crusades? Uh -huh. Again, this isn't the topic of the debate tonight, but let me just say that uh, one of the side areas that I specialized in in my theological studies in Germany is Islam, and uh, I'm persuaded that there are better reasons for believing that God has revealed himself decisively in Jesus of Nazareth by raising him from the dead uh, after his crucifixion, whereas Islam is committed not only to the fact that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, but that he was not even crucified, which is the one historical fact about Jesus of Nazareth that is universally acknowledged by New Testament critics across the spectrum. And so uh, with all the best will in the world, I could not be a Muslim. Uh, I... Um, see a lot of points of commonality. I applaud the monotheism of Islam, but in the end, I think that the Muslim uh, faith gets it wrong about Jesus. So, Dr. Harris, uh, I think that you've posed some interesting challenges to Christianity and to theism in general, but I want to return to the issue of the debate, which is the, moral, the objectivity of morality. And so, you say that the, your basis, you can base objective morality on the assumption that, uh, that this worst possible world is bad. So I, I think that we can all agree that on that statement, that it is bad, but what's to say that that's not simply just a subjective assertion, that it's just something based on human, human opinion? I, it, I don't see any reason to think that that's an objective. Right. Well, I, I tried to, to um, show you in my, in my opening remarks why that particular concern is not uh, interesting or necessary. You, you can play that same game with everything that we think is objective. So why does 2 plus 2 make 4? How, how, how it se seems to make 4 to us, but how do we know that's not just a human intuition? I mean, how, wh what is wrong with a logical argument that contradicts itself? Why is, why is, is um, uh, self-contradiction not a, a, a good way to argue? Well, it just doesn't seem to fly. Now, you could always try to get behind that as an epistemological skeptic or a logical skeptic and say, well, this is just how you monkeys are wired to think. And, in, and there are interesting ways in which science at its forefront does, does create some of that tension. There are ways in which, which, which our, our logical expectations begin to break down in physics. But we use other scientific intuitions, uh, and in this case, mathematical intuitions, to try to, to uh, get behind them. Um, you have to pick your, uh, yourself up by your bootstraps somewhere. Okay? It's, it's, it's better than pulling yourself down by them. Uh, and so you have to, you have to every, every objective paradigm has to make a first move. It has to step into the light based on some axiomatic judgment that is not self-justifying. Uh, Gödel proved this in logic, and and this is if, if this is true for arithmetic, it's true for things far more complicated than arithmetic. I'm saying that that uh, a recognition that this universe offers a spectrum of experience, on the one hand truly intolerable, and on the other sublimely wonderful, and that we all know that movement across this spectrum uh, toward the sublime is better than movement toward the unendurable uh, and pointless suffering. Now, that's, again, you might ask, well, 
what about suffering that actually turns out to be good in the end? What about the suffering of, you know, the stress of learning to play a musical instrument or whatever? Again, that's not a, 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 a counter. I mean, there, there, are there are ways to climb. We might have to go down a little bit to go up to a higher place on this landscape. And that uh, we can make sense of, 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 of that kind of struggle. And so I'm not equating the good with mere pleasure in a way that Dr. Craig suggested. OK, thank you. Yes, Dr. Craig, um, in your refutation of Mr. Harris, you rely very heavily on the distinction between is statements and ought statements where you could take the entire collection of known is statements and never be able to logically derive an ought statement. So I have one question for you. Is the statement, God exists, an is statement or an ought statement? That's an is statement. So you can't derive any moral objective duties from it? Not from that alone. Then you have unstated premises in your argument. Well, no, I stated them clearly. I said that they're based in God's commandments and that uh, moral obligations and duties arise in response to imperatives issued by a competent authority. Uh, and so I would see that our moral duties are grounded in the imperatives issued by the good itself. Okay. Can I actually just add one? Because sure. I want to bring back this notion of uh, psychopathy because it now strikes me as even more relevant than I thought. Um, <laughs> so this, 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 this idea of that morality comes merely from the, the mere issuance of a competent authority. One, one of the features of psychopathy is an inability to distinguish true moral precepts that relate to the well-being of, of people. And things that merely issue from a competent authority. So if you, if you ask children sitting in a classroom, is it okay to drink a soda in class if the teacher gives you permission? Most of them will say yes. If you, if you ask them, is it okay to punch your neighbor in the face if the teacher gives you permission? Children, they, they immediately recognize the distinction between a moral infraction and, and uh, uh, a mere conventional rule. And this, and this is very young children. But children at risk for psychopathy don't. Children at risk for psychopathy think that rules are just given by an authority. So if the teacher tells you you can punch a child in the face, you can punch a child in the face. Um, this is, again, I'm not accusing religious people in general of being psychopaths, but there is there's a psychopathic core to this moral worldview. This divine command theory that Dr. Craig is advocating suggests that if God only tells you to sacrifice your firstborn son, it is good to do it. Uh, that's where goodness comes from. And so you've got, you've got people waking up in trailer parks all over America, suffering s some form of mental illness that's, that's destabilized them and made them vulnerable to this way of thinking. And there are people who kill their children thinking they're Abraham who just didn't get uh, uh, interrupted by an angel. Uh, and this is, this is the kind of uh, a morality that you get out of a divine command theory that, again, offers no retort to, to the jihadist other than, sorry, Buster, you happen to have the wrong God. But that's exactly your retort, 30, Sam, that, 30 that, seconds that God you. has not issued seconds. such a command, and therefore you're not morally obligated to do no, it. No, if, and, God, and, if God did, he would be evil. I mean, so I can get behind that God. If God is issuing that command, well, he's an evil Well, the problem is that you see on atheism, you don't have any basis for making that kind of moral judgment. I've tried to give you a basis. I'm sorry. <laughs> We have time for one more question up there. Uh, this is for Dr. Craig. Um, I wanted to ask you about a consensus. About what? A consensus. Consensus? Yeah, so if, um, if, we're, if we're all looking for the same answer to a question, I think we would value a consensus. And um, the idea of a consensus is something that's very much valued within scientific um, thought. So if God is the basis for morality, it seems like it would be easy to come up with a consensus. And yet within Christianity, uh, among Christians who are reading the same Bible and worshiping the same God, you find an absence of consensus where questions like, is evolution true or is homosexuality wrong? There's a vast variety of debate within Christianity almost as much as there is with uh, Christianity and secularism. And yet in the secular world, those questions, we have found consensus and they've generally been put to rest. So do you, 
value consensus and how do you account for the lack of that within the Christian? Well, consensus on doctrinal issues is not relevant here. You would have to be talking about a lack of consensus on moral issues. And I think there, there would largely be a consensus on moral issues. As I said in my first speech, I'm not offering Dr. Harris a new set of applied ethical values. I think we'd largely agree on the issues of applied ethics. What I'm offering to him is a sound foundation for the moral values and duties that we both hold dear and recognize. So any disagreement about the perception of moral values is an epistemological question, not an ontological question. My, my argument is that on atheism, human beings are just animals. They're electrochemical machines. They don't even have free will. And therefore, there is no objective moral duty. There is no objective moral value to them. And if we're to have a basis for the common moral truths that we, I think, all recognize, we need to have it in a transcendent source that is beyond nature, beyond the shifting sands of culture and opinion, and is rooted in a being who is goodness himself, and whose commands then reflect that goodness uh, to us. We've reached the end of our time. Let's now thank our speakers. Thank